Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Bernhard von Stengel. I'm the acting chair for this session. Um, our head of department uh, had to stay home with COVID. So I, I'll stand in. I'm also here in the mathematics department, and we are very happy to have tonight as a speaker and a very well known mathematical historian or historical mathematician. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, who is actually also here a, a visiting professor with us, normally at the um, Open University, and um, this is June Barrow Green, who um, worked at the, at the Open University since um, a while ago now, I mean, you know, almost 30 years. Um, she was from 2003 to 2005 president of the British Society for the History of Mathematics. And um, from 2007 to 2018, elected member of the Council of the London Mathematical Society and served as a librarian for, for the society. Now, during that time, also something else come out, came out, which I um, at the time saw with absolute enthusiasm, which is uh, this book. Now, it's actually, this is only the cover of the book because the book itself is several kilograms heavy, so I decided not to bring it. It's the Princeton Companion to Mathematics. Uh, Julia is a co-editor, co which is a large collection of articles about mathematical subjects and also history of mathematics uh, that explains a subject that you think was always too complicated to study because it has a lot of, you have to study entire books. There are, these are very good articles, 10 pages that give you an idea of what a particular mathematical field is about or what uh, the history of that field is. I mean, it's a, a highly instructive book and I was, when I was head of the department at the time, I ordered for every graduate student in the department a, a, a copy. They came out as a, as a special deal. So we had about 50 copies of these huge books and this week in the department. And June, as I say, is one of the people responsible for that. that um, June was in 2014, awarded the first, I, I shouldn't probably talk so much. I should give you the <laughs> chair very soon, but um, won several awards, um, and in particular, as uh, the most recent honor was a speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians. I think that was then online, I suspect, or I mean, unfortunately, but um, anyhow, we were very happy to have you here, and so I, I'd rather cut my introduction short and give you the floor. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that nice um, uh, introduction. Um, so my talk is going to be about um, Lola Ross and Hilda Hudson, surprising collaboration on the theory of epidemics. And some of you may well be familiar with the name of Ronald Ross, but um, probably um, not so familiar with the name of Hilda Hudson. Um, but I will... Uh, so I'm going to begin by telling you about Ronald Ross, um, and then I will tell you something about Dr. Hudson um, and their collaboration together and why it's rather surprising. Um, because Ronald Ross was a physician and Hilda Hudson was a dramaturg. Okay, so um, Ronald Ross. So he's well known um, in medical circles because he was the person who discovered um, the role of the mosquito in the transmission of malaria. In fact, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for it in 1902. Um, he was in the Indian Medical Service, um, comes back to uh, Britain at the end of the uh, 19th century to Liverpool, um, is there for um, really up till uh, 1912 when he um, comes to London uh, to King's College. And then during the war, he's in the war office um, and all the time he's doing this work on uh, malaria and particularly I mean, during the war, there was a lot of, um, there was a great need for people who were trying to understand things uh, like uh, diseases and contagious diseases in the trenches for the, for the men in the trenches and he was kind of very involved in that sort of thing. Then he, uh, at the end of his career, he was working in the uh, Ministry of Pensions. Um, so as I say, I mean, he, the fact that uh, he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine is perhaps the thing that people really um, know about him. Um, but perhaps the thing they don't know about him is that he, um, uh, he has a passion for mathematics. And this is a passion he only discovers when he's in India. He happens to, as he says, this is from his memoirs, 
Um, and he says when he commenced to read an old prize book, which he'd won at school, um, called The Orbs of the Heavens. And, it, and in this book, he learned about how mathematics was absolutely fundamental um, to the astronomers um, and how they um, continued with their, their research. And, and he decided, that's it. I really want to study maths. And he buys, um, as he says, I bought nearly all Todd Hunter's series. Now, Todd Hunter was the mathematics textbook writer of the 19th century. Um, he wrote textbooks on, well, Euclid, algebra, calculus, and so on. If you wanted to uh, study maths in the middle of the 19th century, Todd Hunter was a very good person to learn uh, your maths from. Um, and uh, this is exactly what uh, Ross does. And, and it's important to know that he is, he is an autodidact as far as maths is concerned. He does not have a formal mathematical training, but he's he gets completely um, uh, bitten by maths. And if you go and look at his archive in, in um, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow, there's pages and pages of his mathematical notes, um, which just shows how he was always kind of doing some sort of maths, uh, really from this, this time onwards. Um, and when he comes back to England, in his uh, last letter he writes to a friend of his, the biologist Nuttall, he says, um, can you tell me whether immunity has ever been studied mathematically? Um, and at this time, he's coming back, he comes to Liverpool, he reads a paper in front of the Liverpool Mathematical um, Society um, on the algebra of space. It's telling, I think, this paper is published, but he pays for the publication, so it's not uh, published in, in a journal. Um, it's a paper where he's actually trying to build together ideas of uh, Hamilton's Quaternions and Grassmann's algebra. Um, it's not a work of, 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 of huge merit, that has to be said. But, um, but the fact is, it does show his sort of uh, passion for math at the time. But back to this question, well, whether immunity had ever been studied mathematically, Indeed, it had back in the 18th century. Daniel Bernoulli, one of the uh, uh, a member of the, the great Bernoulli family, um, comes up with an epidemiological model for smallpox, and um, and various other people do things. Perhaps one of the the better known is William Farr, who's considered to be one of the modern, one of the founders of medical statistics. He comes up with the bell-shaped or normal curve uh, for epidemics, and then there are there are others um, as well. Um, so Ross isn't the first person to think about immunity um, from a mathematical perspective, but he thinks about it, in a, as we'll see, in a rather different way. Um, and so he starts uh, looking at it from his sort of mosquito um, and malaria perspective. And he's invited to the big Congress in St. Louis in the States in 1904. The International Congress of Arts and Science. And this is a big deal. This is a really big Congress. Um, people come from, many people come from Europe, including, uh, for example, the, the great mathematician Poincaré. Um, there's a math section. There's sections on all, all different sciences and things. And um, as, uh, as he says, this is the first time he presents his, his, some mathematics within an epidemiological context um, to do with mosquito reduction. And as he says himself, he said, he read the paper to, um, uh, uh, to hundreds of doctors, but they were very disappointed because of course they were expecting him to be only talking about medical matters. Um, and um, so, um, so this, this was, you know, I mean, he, he, he recalls this in his memoirs. And the, one of the key things as far as my talk is concerned and the work I've been doing is the, um, the comment that he makes um, in the public, in the published paper, because he says that the results he had with this particular problem, which I'll describe in a minute, he said they agree with those of the late Ronald Hudson, who kindly commenced a similar analysis for me shortly before his lamented death. Now, Ronald Hudson was Hilda Hudson's brother, and when we come to uh, Hilda Hudson, I think um, this is a really key factor in their collaboration, because Ross was known to be quite a difficult character. There were various several polemics he had with other people during his career and the fact that when we when he starts working with Hilda Hudson they slot in they start working together extremely well straight away and um and I think the fact that he knew her brother and he knew her family is is quite key to that relationship um so what 
um, Ross is doing here in this paper, he's interested in if you have a bunch of mosquitoes, um, they're, they're breeding in the center of a pool, where do they go? At a certain point in time, where are all these mosquitoes going to be? Are they all going to be around the edge of the pool? Are they going to go as far away from where they started as, um, as possible? Or are they going to be um, all over the place? Um, and, um, and this is actually quite a hard problem, as we'll see. Um, so he, he continues working on this, and he writes a report on the prevention of malaria in Mauritius in 1908, uh, where he, he brings mathematics into that into it again. And then he publishes another uh, much more general book on the prevention of malaria in 1910, um, where he's talking about epidemiology and uh, it's being principally a mathematical subject. But I want to um, say a little bit about the report on the prevention um, of malaria, because it's in this, um, in this book that he introduces the term pathometry, which is the term that's used for the papers that he writes with um, Hilda Hudson. And also this is where he first articulates the fact that he's gonna start looking at these kinds of problems of the spread of disease and, the, um, and so on using a priori methods. So he assumes a knowledge of the causes, constructs equations, tests results with the statistics. And previously people like Farr, they've started with the statistics. You have an epidemic, you've got a bunch of statistics, how many people, you know, when did they get it? When did they die? And so on. And then you try and make some mathematics um, to fit with your statistics. And Ross was going the other way around. Um, and um, so then when we come to the prevention of malaria, um, where this is where um, I've shown on this slide where the problem is sort of articulated about this business of the mosquitoes, where are we going to find them? Um, and he says, what precisely will be the ratio of insects at a given distance from the pool? He says, well, I attempted a partial mathematical treatment of the problem, but the matter was beyond my mathematical powers, and I therefore referred it to Professor Carl Pearson. Now, Pearson was the professor um, uh, of statistics at uh, University College London. He was uh, one of the kind of architects of, of modern statistics. Um, and so I want to say a bit about that because he, so he writes to Pearson and Pearson says to, to him, he says, well, it would require a strong mathematical analyst to solve the problem. And he says, well, actually the, the difficulty is that if we frame it in the way that you've done with mosquitoes in a pool and things, the mathematicians aren't going to be interested. You know, it's far too practical. We have to have something a bit more abstract. So he said, well, if I restate it as a chessboard problem or something like that, we might get some mathematicians to work on it. So then he says, well, I'll, write, I'll get in touch with you again. I'm going to put out a call at the journal Nature. I'm going to state the problem and see whether anybody, anybody can uh, come up with a um, solution. And what does he do? So he does this. It gets published in Nature in 1905. And the key thing here is, this is what he calls the problem of the random walk. Now, the random walk is um, now a really well-established um, uh, uh, problem in, in, in various sciences, not just in mathematics, in physics, in chemistry, biology. Um, and uh, people are looking at using the mathematics behind the random walk for things like fluctuating stops and Brownian motion, you know, all sorts of things. And people always refer to the fact that the term comes from Pearson. And indeed it does. This is the first time it's published. But in fact, it really goes back to Ross with his, um, uh, because he's the one when we go back and look at here, um, where he talks about the centripetal law of random wandering. Um, and of course, um, Ross is not um, mentioned in this um, letter that, that Pearson, Pearson writes. Um, and I just can't resist actually uh, he, Pearson does get some uh, very useful um, responses from, uh, from this letter, um, and I just wanted to add, well, to show you the, what happens at the end of this, when he, he replies himself, and he says thanks, to, and says the kinds of things that he's got, and he says, the lesson of Lord Rayleigh's solution is that in open country, the most probable place to find a drunken man who is at all capable of keeping on his feet is somewhere near his starting point, um, which I thought was kind of quite a nice little uh, rejoinder uh, at the end. Um, so, um, and then uh, Pearson, with a colleague of his, uh, write a paper about the mathematical theory of, of random migration, which gets published in 1906. Um, so, so this is what Ross is referring to in, um, in the 1908, uh, in, in the 1910 book that he has um, uh, asked Pearson for help, and Pearson has come up with a solution. Um, 
then what happens next is that the prevention of malaria goes into a second edition um, and um, uh, what Ross says um, in the second edition, people have come to him um, because the mathematics he presented there is not, um, is not very full. And so he adds an addendum in the second edition. And you can see it, it's some sort of 35 pages long. It's quite an extensive uh, mathematical elaboration of his ideas. Um, and he says, um, you know, people have, have been concerned about where I presented things because of the large number of variables involved. So he's here, he's uh, presented a system of differential equations to represent the uh, course uh, in a community of um, uh, that are infected of a disease in a community infected by malaria. Um, and he says, well, um, the problem is that epidemiology, because it's concerned with variation disease from time to time or from place to place, must be considered mathematically, however many variables are implicated, if it's to be considered scientifically, scientifically at all. And the mathematical method of treatment is really nothing but the application of careful reasoning to the problems at issue. And then he says, I am convinced that many readers will be able to follow the work without difficulty. Um, a few years, well, um, nearly 20 years later, he does slightly revise his view about that remark. He says, the addendum was written in a great hurry. The whole article was very confusedly written and was almost meaningless to readers and even to myself. Um, so um, there wasn't a huge uh, sort of response to this. Um, and in fact, um, people again kind of came back to him. So he then uh, writes another shorter article in Nature, um, which is a response to some clarifications. Um, and what's interesting here is that in this article in Nature, he says that he's been in touch with um, uh, Frank Carey, who's a professor of maths at Liverpool, and Carey has referred him to Forsyth, who is the um, Fatalarian professor at Cambridge. That's the, basically the only pure mathematics professorship at Cambridge at the time. So he's been put in touch with um, the sort of main people, if you like, um, within the mathematical community. So he is getting himself um, sort of into uh, the maths community. But um, one of the things that he kind of is always bashing the drum on is the fact that doctors are not interested in anything to do with, with maths. Um, and that this is kind of holding things back. And, um, and on this, this quote here, he says, well, at present medical ideas regarding the, these factors, the things that he's sort of been uh, writing about are generally so nebulous that almost any statements about them pass muster and often retard or misdirect important preventative measures for years. Um, and we keep seeing him um, making these kinds of remarks about the, the, the really the problem that uh, between the medical profession and, and mathematicians. Um, um, one, one response he does get is from the um, uh, mathematician um, and demographer Alfred Lotka, um, who proposes a solution to Ross's malaria problem, proposes a solution to the differential equations. Ross has sort of come up basically with what he thinks is going to be the conclusion, but hasn't really solved, solved the equations. And Lotka is somebody who kind of is woven in throughout this story one way or another. We'll see his name coming up again. He's probably better known to mathematicians for the uh, Lotka Volterra, Volterra equations um, in ecology. Um, so then we move on a few years to 1915, and Ross publishes a paper in the British Medical Journal. And, um, uh, and he refers back to this work in the uh, book on prevention of malaria. And this is where he talks about a priori and pathometric equations. And he, he gives a sort of outline of the sorts of ideas that he's got about um, uh, epidemio epidemiology being studied mathematically. Um, but he says, as a kind of, uh, in this paper at the end, he says the full paper on the subject is going to be more suitable for mathematical than for medical publications. He thinks, well, you know, there's no way the doctors are going to understand what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to publish it somewhere else. Um, he does get a response from John Brownlee, um, who has been doing work on epidemics, but doing it from an Pascal Sterori um, uh, uh, perspective. Um, and he, he writes um, uh, an article for the BMJ, which sort of brings people up to date with the sorts of things he's been doing. He has written quite a few articles uh, previously, and Ross uh, refers to his work. Um, but, oh, sorry. Um, um, 
And then what happens is uh, Ross's paper, the mathematical bit of, um, that he is referred to, gets published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society and uh, submits it in 1915. It gets published in 1916. And so what's in this, uh, in this work? Well, um, he says, this is a much more advanced and general development of the work that he'd written up in the, in the addendum, which had been very much con um, uh, concerned with um, malaria. So he's now widening his ideas out and saying, look, actually we can have some general models to show how something, not just a disease spreads, but also you know, other, other things, we can, we can apply this in, in various ways. But if we, if we want to look at it in just particularly from a disease perspective, he says, well, we can have something like we have a population of living individuals that you know, some of them are affected by a disease, some of them aren't. Um, and we, we look at them as a proportion and we look at what happens if those that are unaffected become affected and, and those who are unaffected, then they either recover or they, uh, or they die, so they become unaffected. And then what, what are the things we need to think about? Well, we need to think about the birth rates, the death rates, the emigration and the immigration for both sets, for the affected and the unaffected. And then if we, we think about all of these things, we put them all together, what, um, and we're looking at it as time passes, what will be the number of affected individuals of new cases and of, of the total population uh, at the particular time? So he, he ends up with um, a system of three differential equations, with these eight variational um, elements, which he considers as constants. And he examines various um, different cases. Um, and it doesn't get much uh, reaction, but of course we are now in uh, the middle of World War I. Um, but he does get a reaction from Major Greenwood. Uh, Major was uh, a first name, it wasn't his, uh, uh, an army title. Um, he says, no sensible man doubts the importance of investigations such as these. It's high time epidemiology was extricated from its present humiliating position as the plaything of bacteriologists and public health officials, or as at best a field for antiquarian research. Um, so he's he's really on, you know he's really on on Ross's side here. He, you know, it's a kind of general article, but it, it's um, prompted by by this article of Ross's. Um, so then, what happens next? is at the end of part one, uh, that was part one of the paper, Ross has promised there's gonna be a part two, he gives the titles of the sections to appear, but when the part two appears, some of those uh, section titles have gone, some new ones had appeared. Um, and so the question is, what happened? Why, why did he not uh, continue as he, as, he had, uh, as he had promised? He got bogged down with the maths. Um, he sort of knew the sorts of things he wanted to do, but he, he couldn't actually do the maths. And he also knew that he needed to have somebody to help him with, um, with the statistics, because the idea had been to actually get the theory all sorted out and then to throw the statistics at it and see whether actually the theory did um, match up um, with the statistics. So whether you actually it confirmed um, what the statistics told you. Um, once you um, compare the two things together. Um, um, so we can see things like this is a draft um, that's in the, in the uh, Ross archive in, in Glasgow. And um, in the preface to part two, um, this is what he says. He says um, that the Royal Society was kind enough to give him a grant to provide him with assistance to complete the paper and carry it, carry it further. And Miss Hilda P. Hudson was appointed for the work and the continuation of the paper has been written. Uh, with her, and I'd like to take the opportunity to express my obligations to her for her valuable assistance, especially in regard to part three. So now uh, it's time to introduce Hilda Hudson. So she was, she came from a very mathematical family. I've already uh, mentioned her brother, but her father was professor of maths at King's College London. He was a, a Cambridge uh, Wrangler, he'd been the third Wrangler. His, um, her mother, was um, had also studied maths at Newnham, uh, had met her father uh, because he was tutoring the women at Newnham, and so she left Newnham after a year and married her, her father. Um, her sister also studied maths, so the two girls studied maths at Cambridge, um, and at a time when women could not get degrees at Cambridge, women could not get degrees at Cambridge until 1948. Um, and at the time, Girton and Newnham were not part of the university. The women were allowed to sit the mathematical tripos. Um, that 
battle had been won for them by, by Charlotte Scott in 1880, who had sacked the mathematical titles, but at that point, that you could only, as a woman, sit it if you had permission. She did so well, she was equivalent to the eighth wrangler, that the university said, well, all right, um, any woman who wants to can sit the mathematical titles. Um, but uh, Hilda Hudson's sister was equivalent to the eighth wrangler in 1900, and she herself was equivalent to the seventh wrangler in 1903. And this, this was, this, these are remarkable results, really remarkable results. She becomes a lecturer um, uh, at Newnham, um, and then she takes a job at the West Ham Technical Institute as a um, sort of lecturer in, in Pool and Applied Maths. During the war, she's with the uh, Air Ministry, um, working in aeronautical engineering, and after the war for a short time, she has a job with uh, Parnell and Company, her aircraft manufacturer. So that's, that's her, her working life. As for her academic life, um, while she's at Newnham, she goes to Berlin for a while to attend lectures by Schwarz, Schotky, and Landau. And this, again, this was unusual. Um, not many male uh, postgraduates studied in, in um, abroad at the time. So for her to go was a, it tells you something about how good she was as a mathematician, also tells you that her parents could afford uh, for her to go, but also that they uh, supported her. Um, and then in 1906, she gets an MA from Trinity College Dublin. Um, and this is um, means that she was one of what was known as the steamboat ladies. And these were women from Oxford and Cambridge who traveled to Dublin to get um, degrees that were awarded by Trinity College. The Trinity College had set up um, they had this arrangement because, of course, there were also men at um, Oxford and Cambridge at the time who couldn't get degrees because, for example, if they were Jewish um, and um, if they didn't subscribe to the 39 articles and things. Um, and then at the, for this particular period, they allowed women uh, to do the same thing. And that, apparently they were completely overwhelmed. They had no idea that there would be that many women would, would come over um, and, get, um, and, and, and get degrees. And uh, Hilda, Hilda Hudson was one of them. So um, what else? She was the first woman to give a lecture at an international congress of mathematicians. She wasn't the first woman to be invited. That uh, honor went to uh, Laura Fossati in 1908 in Rome, but uh, sadly she died before she could give her lecture. But Hilda Hudson did give her lecture at Cambridge um, in uh, the UK. Um, uh, the year 1912, 1913, she, uh, she goes to Bryn Mawr, the Women's College in the US, which in fact is where Charlotte Scott the woman I mentioned who was a equivalent to the eighth wrangler in, in 1880 was the professor of maths. Um, she gets uh, a doctorate from Trinity College Dublin um, in 1913. Um, and then we see she works with Ross during 1916. In 1917, she's the first woman to be on the council of the London Mathematical Society. She gets an OBE for her work, war work, that's the aeronautical work. And then in 1927, she uh, publishes her book, Promona Transformations in Plane and Space. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, she's a geometer. Um, uh, her publications, her papers, her research is all in geometry. And 19, uh, her book in 1927 was the sort of culmination of, of her work in, in, in geometry. Um, and it's the thing, if people know anything about her, it is for this, uh, this book um, that she published in 1927. With the book published, we'll see that she comes back and she works with, um, with Ross again. So how does their relationship begin? So the first thing, we, uh, first letter I found in the archives that, that relates to this is she writes to him and she says, I understand that Miss Thomas, and I don't know who Miss Thomas was, has mentioned me to you in connection with mathematical work of importance during the war, and I should be very glad to know about it. I can only assume that she might, Miss Thomas might have been someone at the West Ham Technical Institute, because that's where Hudson is at the time. Um, but it's, it's quite clear from the correspondence that she had never met Ross um, before. Um, and he replies, he says, I'm very glad you may be available, uh, especially as your brother, who was unfortunately killed in Wales 10 years ago, was a friend of mine and helped me considerably with some old mathematical work which I've been doing. And her brother, who had been senior wrangler in 1904, and who I mentioned earlier, um, very tragically was killed um, uh, climbing in Wales. Um, and I think that this is, as I said earlier, this is key to their relationship, that he knew the family, he knew about her, he knew of the, the sort of mathematical, um, there was mathematics in, in, in the family there. Um, and so the, the letters become very, um, 
engaging very, very quickly, I think. Um, and um, uh, so what does she ask him, uh, uh, what does Ross ask Hudson to do? Um, he explains to her what's been in the first paper, um, what he's done, um, and he says, well, what I really want is the application um, of my curves to actual, uh, the application of the curves to actual academics. So, so the statistical work, so to, to, to throw the, um, the, the numbers at it. But in fact, he's got bogged down with what's actually he wants to put in the paper. When you look at the, uh, at the papers in the archives, the things that she's doing, he's sort of uh, that original second draft. When you see the things that she writes, that things get changed quite considerably. He also mentions to her, if she's not you know, quite up to speed with the statistics, well, then he's sure to get Carl Pearson to help. Importantly, he mentions that the work will be published with names appearing jointly. This would not have been necessarily the case. And he knew that she was a published mathematician. This would be something that would be important for her. Um, and um, he was going to be the lead author of all. It was his, it were his ideas. It was his, it was all basically originating with him, but he was going to put her name on the paper jointly. And uh, this, there were not, apart from this, there were not so many papers with uh, joint publications at the time. Pearson was one of the few people who did also publish with, uh, with women. He had uh, some women uh, computers uh, working in his uh, laboratories. But, um, but I think this shows, in a way, to me, how keen he was um, uh, to get her working alongside. Because, of course, the fact that the, um, uh, he wrote to the uh, Royal Society and he said that he asked the Royal Society for a government grant to pay for a lady mathematician to assist him was because, of course, he knew that during the war, there would be no chance of getting um, a gentleman mathematician. Um, so, um, and then she was going to be paid for the work. Uh, Hudson responds, she says, yep, I'm going to do it. And she thinks she finds the ideas all very interesting and just as important as if it had been the war job that she had supposed it to be. So my reading of that is I think that she, she quite reasonably would have assumed it would have been something to do with um, ballistics or, or something, probably not knowing quite why Ross would be involved with that, but, or something that was more directly connected with the work that he was doing in the, um, with the uh, war office or, or whatever. Um, but this was very clearly um, a mathematical problem that had application, not just, just for the war. Um, uh, Ross is very happy with the, with the arrangement, so he makes it, has an announcement. There's an announcement in the British Medical Journal, um, and uh, he announces her appointment and says that the work's going to be carried on in the Marcus Beck Laboratory. The Royal Society of Medicine gives it a, a really official sort of stamp. So, um, so now they can they can get underway, and um, and what happens is that two papers get published. It, in reality, it's only one paper. Uh, the two papers are published consecutively um, in the proceedings, and it's to do with the policy of the proceedings. The number of pages that they would allow for an article. Journals tend to have these kinds of. Uh, of policies, so rather than publish it in one of the other Royal Society journals, um, where it will be sort of separated from the original part, it makes sense to publish them um, as two um, uh, consecutive articles. Um, so, um, uh, interestingly, the paper was refereed by Eddington. So Eddington was a professor of astronomy at Cambridge, probably best known for the fact that he went out on the expedition in 1919 to, to um, look at um, Einstein's, to check whether Einstein's theory of, of, of relativity um, was uh, worked out uh, correctly. Um, so probably not somebody you would expect to be refereeing a paper on um, mathematical epidemiology. But of course, again, um, Cambridge and, and Sort of mathematicians everywhere were either um, have, have been conscripted for war work in various in various ways. Eddington, the university had applied for um, uh, for him uh, not to be sent to the front or to do anything else, um, and uh, he was also had religious reasons for not wanting to fight too. Um, so anyway, so he's the person who ends up um, refereeing it, and he says, well, the paper gives a useful survey of the possibilities and should be a guide in interpreting the significance of epidemic statistics. The theory is, of course, rather dull, and the mathematics elementary. 
but it is evidently desirable that some such treatment of statistics should be made. And the authors in the preface state that they are undertaking application to actual figures. So he, he picks up on it. He says, well, this is, you know, really, okay, they can do this math. The math isn't terribly interesting, but, you know, it just might be right, which would be, um, um, if they can throw some statistics at it, that will show that it is right, and then, then it can be very applicable and um, we can use it. Um, so, so the papers are indeed published. And um, so just to give a brief um, overview of what's in them, um, again, as I've said earlier, we have, you know, we have the two um, uh, cases of people. Um, we have the effective and the non-effective cases of proportion of a population. Um, and we consider them as functions of time. And then we look at them uh, depending on how these eight variation elements, uh, what happens when they're given different values. And um, they, they, they do, they do, do these um, sort of uh, calculations and they look at various examples and particularly to begin with thinking about um, an infection rate of uh, one person will in infect one other person daily and then they look at lower rates of infection and and then they get a bunch of different results depending on, on um, how they, they tweak the various numbers um, so if you suddenly if the contagion suddenly ceases um, but everything else remains the same then the mod their model says well actually not everything is, is, is not going to stop automatically what the population will continue to suffer from its effects for some time afterwards, which, of course, is what we what we see. Um, and um, one of the things they highlight in this paper, they say if you've got a high infection rate and the reversion rate is low, i.e. people either uh, recover or, or, or they die, then the epidemic curve becomes nearly a symmetrical uh, bell-shaped curve. And this was they uh, this was really um, good news because this corresponded to the sorts of results that Brownlee had been getting with looking at it from the other uh, from the other way around. Um, and then in part three, they look uh, at different variations in infectivity. They bring in graphical methods and they say, well, we we can actually when we look at what happens with this rate of infection, we we can we can see what we know what kind of curves we, we've got, but we don't know the equations, and we need to kind of work out. Uh, what the equations are going to be. Um, we need to think about other things like incubation. Um, so absolute time and how long somebody might be harboring the disease before they show it and so on and the duration of, of the disease. Um, um, and one of the really key things in this third part, and this is, this is really uh, due to Hudson, is considering immunity. And so this um, gives you a third bunch of people because if you allow for infected individuals to recover into an immune state, so they are um, a, a third lot. So you, and this is a very early version of what's known as the SIR model, which probably most of you are familiar with, um, uh, which has been in the papers, of course, with the, um, everywhere else um, with the pandemic. So it's a susceptible infected removed uh, model. And they get a bunch of curves coming out, um, uh, depending on, on the rates of infectivity, but the way they, they shuffle the, the numbers and things around. So you get things like a periodic curve when you have a regular rise and fall um, due to seasonal disturbances and things like we see with, uh, with, with COVID. Um, and overall, they say, well, this suggests that the rise and fall of epidemics, as far as we see at present, can be explained by the general laws of happenings. That's what uh, the name uh, Ross gives it, a studied in this paper. So they feel that they've really, um, uh, got to kind of grips with the kind of mathematics behind um, the, the um, flow, of, flow of epidemics. But, and they come up with a bunch of uh, final remarks and they say things like, well, we haven't paid much uh, attention to the actual values of the constants that we've put in for all these variation elements. Um, what we've tried to do is come up with a model that can be used in a variety of cases. Um, and we've, in one case, in part one, mortality and infectivity were regarded as constants, might be true. Um, also, um, lots of other factors that we haven't taken into account, age, gender, social conditions, and so on. Whole population divided into two classes only, except when immunity is considered. So they see that actually that's a, that's a problem. Um, uh, and they say, actually, it's, it's not difficult probably to write down the equations. You can throw a whole bunch of variables, doesn't matter how many variables you throw, you can still write down the equation but they're going to be jolly difficult to solve and they'll probably be unsuitable um, to use for numerical work. And then you'd have to use um, much more um, time-consuming methods like series expansions in order to um, get anything out of them. And then they also mentioned the fact that if you only have a small number of people, 
then that uh, means you can't um, use the calculus really because you can't think uh, of if you only got a small number you can't think of it as a continuous of them as continuous functions of time which is what um, the, their whole uh, theory have been based on so this is a, a big drawback when you've got um, just low numbers um, so what about the application of the theory to, act, uh, to actual epidemics, which is what uh, Eddington had picked up on and what Ross had promised and what actually Ross and Hudson had promised. Um, and um, it's clear that's what they intended to do. Um, they say at the beginning of uh, the preface of part two that they are look, starting to look at records of epidemics to see how far their results uh, may be applied to them. But we're not going to talk about that here. So that's in part two and part three. And then we see in, in October 1916, Hudson writes to Ross and she says, have you had time to go through the last set of papers I left with you? And that, those are the proofs of the uh, published article. So I'm hoping they we got into printable form before we start on much numerical work. So they haven't really started on the numerical work at this time, but that's what is really what the plan is. But then things get uh, slightly stuffed because in December 1916, um, the Admiralty gets in touch with Hudson and she's offered the post of temporary technical assistant in the aircraft construction department. Um, and as she says to Ross, this is nationally, nationally important work and it's urgent. And so I really feel I have to accept to do this um, and uh, resign from my work with you. And Ross is very uh, sorry to lose her and hopes that she'll come back um, basically when the war is over. Um, uh, she doesn't give up on the work altogether. The correspondence does continue um, sporadically. And so, for example, in March uh, 1918, she reviews a paper uh, for Lot, uh, by Lotka for Ross that says, you know, I can't really give it the attention I'd like to because aer aeroplane design is rather more urgent just now. So we're still, still um, in the sort of dying stages of, of the war. Um, but then once the war is over, uh, Ross is hopeful that she'll come back, but she decides actually no. She wants to get on with her her, her book on uh, Cremona transformations, um, and she feels she wants to go back to Cambridge, where she can be near a library. And she says, I'm, it's sad to rule out the epidemic work, but I feel fairly clear about it. Um, but she says, look, I've got a bunch of, um, of uh, people working with me, um, and I think it would be really good if one of them worked with you. And in fact, probably her most um, mathematically talented assistant then writes to Ross and offers um, to work, uh, for him, but he rejects it. And he just says, no, I'm afraid, you know, I can't get money for you. I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'm absolutely certain that if Hudson had said, I want to carry on with this work, he would have absolutely jumped at it. He just, he knew he liked working with her. He knew he could trust her. And he, he just wasn't in a frame of mind to, to start working with anybody else. So how were these papers uh, received? Well, of course, again, being published during the war, People had um, other things on their mind. There is a review um, in the Yard book. Uh, Polly uh, notes them, but he says basically it's not necessary to say very much about them because the main focus is not mathematical. There's no new mathematics here. So, really, um, I, I don't need to, to say very much about them. And the Yard book, of course, being the, the German reviewing journal, the reviewing journal at the time, it's like MathSignet of, of today. Um, Lotka responds, um, but mainly to Ross's work on malaria epidemiology. So he's focusing on that aspect of it rather than on the general, um, the general um, issues that uh, the, the papers raise. Um, and then Ross in his memoirs writes, he says, well, um, and this is uh, sort of some six or seven years after the event, he says, well, for years I've been toiling at the attempt to fix mathematics on the general theory of epidemics. And in 1918, um, uh, typo there he says the royal society published my first paper and gave me the capable assistant of miss hilda p hudson after a second paper the war interrupted our studies but so little interest was taken in them by the health authorities that i have thought it useless to continue them since then so he's he's given up he's decided well you know the, the medics aren't interested nobody's interested and, so, um, and he, he scribbles away doing other bits of maths and things but his his main concern of course is his work on uh, various aspects of malaria um, so what happens next? Well, what happens next is a very famous paper um, by Kermack and McKendrick, a contribution to the mathematical theory of epidemics. This is considered to be um, generally the kind of one of the, the, the founding paper of the SIR model. Um, but they do refer to the work of Ross and Hudson, 
Um, and um, so actually it does originate in the work of Bochner, but it, it's made much more explicit here. And, um, and when you look at the history of mathematical epidemiology, it comes back to Kermit and McKendrick. But importantly for my story is that McKendrick was encouraged by Ross to study epidemics using, using that. They knew each other well, they, they sailed to and from Sierra Leone together. Um, and there's quite a lot has been, uh, is known about the fact that they um, discussed mathematics um, a lot uh, together. Um, and uh, this, Ross sees this paper and is immediately galvanized. He's galvanized into action. And he asks Hudson if she'll continue the work on photometry. She says to him, yes, I can give you one day a week. She's not, uh, she has no job um, at that time after she's uh, finished working for the aircraft manufacturers in 2021. She never has another um, paid, no more paid employment. My assumption is that her parents, had, or her mother had died when she was extremely young, but her father had died um, by this time. And um, her brother, of course, had died. Her sister doesn't marry. So I think she presumably was able to live off uh, uh, her inheritance. Um, and um, Ross, so she says, yes, I'll do it. And Ross sends her the kind of Hendrick paper um, uh, and asks her what, what she thinks about it. And there's then a sort of flurry of activity because Ross then thinks, oh, well, people are now really interested in this um, uh, uh, material. Um, and he applies to Royal Society to get the three papers published together as a book. Um, uh, Hudson, and meanwhile, she's been reading the Kermit and McKendrick. She's very happy when results compare favorably with theirs. Um, and she says, actually, we've really now got to get on with making these numerical comparisons and asked him for records of epidemics. And she wants actually to include that in the book. Um, and she says, also, we really need to address this problem of the constants. Um, we haven't really looked at what the best values for these constants are. And she says, well, I hope actually we can do better than Kermit and McKendrick have done with their constants. Um, but the need is to find these statistics and we need really big sets of statistics. We need ones that run to thousands of cases. Um, and, um, uh, and so this continues in January um, and, and we can see Ross is slightly kind of going off the board. He's slightly losing the plot. I mean, he says, I'm trying hard to understand my previous mathematical papers, but he's not really able to do it. And then he says, um, I wrote the paper I wrote in the proceedings to which you added the second and third parts. Well, I mean, he certainly contributed quite a bit to the second part. Um, Hudson says she doesn't want to publish a new paper with the Royal Society because that's what he's thinking about. He wants to kind of see if they can develop their ideas further, but she's quite happy for them to publish the book. Um, he then writes back and says, well, I've been reading that dreadful paper by Ross and Hudson, and I've also understood my first paper and have greatly admired the concluding part three by Hudson. It's very well done. Some of the figures which you produced ought to have shown Gill, who wrote his medical work on the genesis of epidemics, that we have already included his curious recuperations in our conjoint paper. But of course, doctors seldom know a word of mathematics, so they can write any rubbish they please. Um, so he's he's never he's never gets over this uh, problem with the doctors. Um, and then he goes uh, he goes public about them working together. He says, actually, you know, I'm, we're back on the case. Um, I'm, Work needs to be done, um, and we're now. Um, I, I've got Hilda Hudson back again, and we're we're now working on it, um, and we're beginning to consolidate and summarize summarize our previous studies and to develop them by means of finite calculus and decimal calculus and by the use of integral equations, um, and uh, so things are looking promising. Um, and what we find in the archive is a paper called Two Party Aggregates that he's written. Um, and uh, to which her name gets appended, but it never gets published. And this is where the quote that I showed you uh, at the beginning came from about the addendum, because this is where he says the addendum was written in a great hurry, whole article confusedly written and almost meaningless to readers, even to myself. Um, but this, uh, there's a, a lot of sort of mathematical um, sort of scribblings and things in Ross's archive, but this is the, uh, the paper that comes out of it, but actually there's nothing really, really new in it and um, it, uh, it doesn't get published, but, um, and it doesn't get submitted anywhere. But meanwhile, Hudson is, uh, is still on the case. She's written a review of Kermit and Kendrick for Science in Progress, and Science in Progress is the journal that Ross um, edits. He's the editor of it, and she writes a two-page, two-and-a-bit-page uh, review, um, and, um, and she says that they've made a definitive 
a definite addition to our knowledge on a subject on which too little work has been done and hope that will be carried further. She's a, she's a bit annoyed with their, they're a bit loose mathematically. They use the square root of minus Q for a real constant. And she says they don't really discuss the relative orders of quantities when they're too, too, very small, but these are kind of minor, minor quibbles. Um, but it shows that she's really engaged with the topic again. Um, and then she starts working on statistics. Um, she says um, what she really wants to get hold of are the statistics from the Maidstone typhoid epidemic of 1897, um, and also the measles, there were a lot of measles epidemics in Liverpool, and she's gathering, she's, she's writing to us and she's saying, look, I think I can get this material from here and this material from there, um, and so forth. Uh, one little um, nugget that I got from the correspondence, which I thought was just sort of quite interesting, that she told him that she was going to be away in Birmingham for a while because she's doing a fortnight's intensive electioneering on behalf of a friend um, and admirer of Ross. And this was um, someone who was standing for the Labour Party, but um, unfortunately um, didn't, didn't get in. But I think it, it's nice to see a kind of, a, you know, a different side of her um, here. Um, and... Um, uh, and then we can see that um, uh, correspondence continues and in, in quite a kind of uh, informal way, Ross writes to her at one point, says, I haven't seen you for a long time. I expect you must be getting scout or some other physical disability. So I notice ladies don't care a button about any other one. And then um, uh, she's invited to lunch because Lotka is going to have lunch um, with, uh, with Ross. At this point, the correspondence is done from Ross's secretary um, because he's, he's now had a, had a stroke. Um, and, um, uh, and although he's, he's still sort of intellectually active, um, he's not physically uh, very strong. Um, then in 1931, the three papers do get published as a book um, with an introduction by Ross, but no numerical comparisons, just, just the three papers. Um, and then uh, the final thing in the archive is um, this Sort of history that Ross himself writes, um, and it's just a manuscript. But what's interesting, I think, is the fact that he, uh, what he writes is he says, well, you know, I'm very well known, of course, because of my uh, discovery for which I got the Nobel Prize. Um, but he says, in my own opinion, my principal work has been to establish the general laws of epidemics, um, and um, and I think it's very, uh, it's very telling, really, that you know, maths was always there for him. And, and I, he, he, re, he did recognize how important this work was, but it just didn't really get taken up sufficiently um, when he was really in the, in the thick of it. Um, and, um, and so he, 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 recounts the, he recounts the history of and takes how long it took him and so forth, and then he's in as well. Um, and then they, the Royal Society gave him the services of an accomplished mathematician, Miss Hilda P. Hudson, um, and, and so forth. Um, so this is how Ross views it, looking back, um, and of course, he's, he's into his 70s by now. Um, and as I say, he's, he's, not, um, he's not very well. Um, so that um, is, um, oh yes. So I wanted to say just a little bit about um, the, some of the later responses um, to their papers. So we start seeing people writing about them from the 50s um, and people mention that Ross employed, uh, employed the idea of chance probability in formulating the basic equations. Um, for the first time, it was possible to use a well-organized mathematical theory as a research tool in epidemiology, 1957. 1975, um, probably the most important contribution made by tropical medicine to theoretical and methodological corpus of contemporary epidemiology is the fast work of Sir Ronald Ross. Um, and then um, more recently, he's to Beacon Roberts uh, say that their work marks the start of infectious disease dynamics as a scientific field and so on. Um, what's... Uh, interesting here is that I think that what we see mostly until a bit later is Hudson's name doesn't appear. It appears when, if there's a, if there's a bibliography, of course it appears because her name is attached to his um, as one of the authors of the paper. Um, um, I just wanted to mention a couple of uh, other uh, ways in which um, Hudson collaborated with Ross. Um, and um, uh, in 1916, uh, Ross is uh, doing some other mathematics, and he writes a paper on the iteration of certain functions, um, which later gets rejected by the Royal Society. And um, as we look in the Royal Society archives, we can see that Burnside, William Burnside, the group theorist, writes a long uh, review um, articulating why it should be rejected. McMahon 
person Maman says, yeah, publish it, fine. And Paul Sy says, yeah, okay, but you need to do something about it. So that's uh, rejected. Um, and in June 1917, Ross recommends that Hudson um, uh, asks if she'll help um, his friend, the biologist, um, Nuttall, who's uh, the book professor of biology at Cambridge. And I just thought I would just show you this. So Ross writes to Nuttall and says, I've got your solution of your problem. And the problem is about body lice. Um, I hope it's all right. She's very busy with war work and says she's had to put down this note on the train. Now, of course, body lice was a real problem, again, for men in the trenches. So this was important work to be done. Um, and so what does she do? Um, so in the publication, uh, we see that he writes that Miss H.B. Hudson has kindly calculated for me that a female body louse would have 1918 descendants during her lifetime, and that the offspring of her daughters during their lifetime would number 112,778, which is rather an alarming prospect, I would suggest. Um, um, but it also says, I mean, the maths which he needed to do this was not complicated. And I think it's quite revealing that somebody in this position wasn't able to work it out. Um, uh, for themselves, but it also shows that you know she was happy. To, she would, she could, if she could oblige, she would, um, and it, she didn't mind um, what it, what it was about if, um, uh, as far as mathematics is concerned. Um, so to conclude, um, various uh, conclusions I've come to about this story. One, I think, of course, it provides us with an example of an opportunity provided by the war for women mathematicians, um, and. Um, it demonstrates Hudson's versatility as a mathematician and her willingness and ability to collaborate. So we see that um, with the way she works with Ross and she gets him to change you know, the ideas that he has about the way that the, the mathematical model that he's beginning to establish develops with her input. Um, also her work, of course, in aer aeronautics. Uh, she's a geometer. You know, these, these, are far, these are kind of away from, from, from geometry. And then you know, the fact that she's happy to, uh, she'll write reviews for him, she'll, um, she'll help, you know, with a calculation for his, his chum on, on, on body lice. Um, I think it exposes Ross's lack of mathematical training. He couldn't have continued this work without her. But the maths, as Eddington said, it wasn't, there wasn't anything um, really difficult about it, but it needed her, her Cambridge training to be able to just go straight to the heart of it and be able to sort out the differential equations properly and get, the, get everything in, in, um, in reasonable mathematical order. Um, uh, I think what it's nice you see her, she starts off as an assistant, and uh, by the end she's uh, he's describing her as an expert mathematician, um, which I which I very much like. Um, I think it's worth observing the slow reception of the Ross Hudson papers. Uh, of course, being published during the war um, has got a lot to do with it. But I think in the two competing things really are the fact that there's the reluctance of the medical profession to engage with the mathematics. And the fact that the novelty is in the application, it's not in the mathematics. So there was no reason really for the mathematician to, to get excited and start um, doing anything with it. Um, and I think um, uh, there's also the fact there's a tendency for Hudson's role to be passed over. In her London Mathematical Society obituary, uh, which focuses, and, and rightly so, on her work in geometry, um, it doesn't make any mention of her work as well. It lists the papers in um, her list of papers at the end, but there's, it's, not even, it's not even mentioned, the fact that she worked with them. Um, um, and um, I'd just like to, my final uh, remark is really, I want to thank very much the archivists who've helped me with this. Um, Claire Harrison at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow, Claire Franklin at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Rupert Baker at the Royal Society, all of whom have been immensely helpful, and particularly during the pandemic, sending me um, digital copies of things um, and uh, are making me very welcome when I went, went to the archives. So um, and that's uh, where I'll stop. Thank you. Probably more than now that you're more flexible here on the stage, and then we have questions. And um, I um, also want to observe the online chat now. There is, I saw some some red thing with the chat, but I didn't see anything on my thing. Um, Joe, did you see anything? Just to check, I mean, I might have a, a, the wrong kind of channel here because I saw some red things in the. And um, so it's, it's, let me put it this way. 
the problem is we are here in a webinar and people cannot ask. So, so the problem is I have I see nothing here online, but there was something. That's why I'm confused. I mean, was this a chat symbol? Never mind. So we go to the to the audience first, or uh, probably oh, exclusive VFD. Is it relevant for quite heavily on Minkowski's work because he was unable to do the differential geometry. He was unable to do the maths, but then that was very successful. And I'm not really sure why, you know, Einstein was able to pull out his work and take the, the works of Minkowski and other mathematicians and be ubiquitous nowadays while here, we see the same thing. So we see a novel idea. There is a, a lack in the maths department, but it does not really gain the same traction. So my question is, is that due to the idea not being that groundbreaking in this case, well, I, you know, within the epidemics field? Or is it just, you know, Einstein was lucky enough to stumble upon someone who's very good at what they're doing to just kind of work that collaboration better? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the mathematics there is in a completely different league <laughs> to the math here, I think. Um, I mean, I think very much this case is not something that the mathematicians, I mean, so we had Polyai, we had, um, uh, you know, looking at it and saying, and Eddington, I mean, that recognizing that actually it's the, it's the novel application and you need to kind of have some knowledge of the, uh, the medical knowledge about, you know, disease and contagion and all of these things um, to recognize how important this could be in a public health arena. But um, uh, Ross couldn't get the doctors interested in it. And actually, I think, I mean, I found this quite interesting because I found a parallel with um, mathematicians and engineers during the First World War. So there were, um, uh, there were engineers who weren't interested in the, in the mathematics, some of the mathematics in, in aeronautics. And there were, in, this ca in that case, there were mathematicians who were saying, look, actually you need you need to use mathematics to work out whether these aeroplanes are going to fly or, or how you get out of a spin and all of these kinds of things. So it, it does seem to me that at this period, the, the different constituencies, scientific constituencies, um, you know, are, are a bit siloed. Um, and, uh, and so kind of breaking down those barriers seems to be quite difficult. And I think, of course, the war at this whole period does throw everything into disarray because people are there. Their interests are, you know, not only elsewhere scientifically, they're elsewhere emotionally. I mean, there's just so much going on. So I think, you know, I can't take that out of the picture. You mentioned about uh, uh, Hudson's obituary. Sorry. You mentioned uh, about Hudson's obituary, and no, uh, but there's no nothing about Ross, uh, working with Ross. What about Ross's obituary? Is there any mentioning of uh, him working with Hudson? Well, he me he mentions her in his memoirs, um, and then of course there are zillions of obituaries of Ross. I mean, you know, he's a hugely famous person, um, and so and he does masses and masses of of, of things. So this work is um, is probably listed. I mean, I haven't looked at all of of, of Ross's um, obituaries. I wouldn't expect there to be. Um, much there beyond her name being mentioned, um, saying that he worked with worked with her, and that's a good point. Actually, I should probably go back and look. I mean, there's just there's just so much you can find out so much about him, um, and the focus is is very much on the um, on the malaria side of side of things. Um, but in her case, I think you know she didn't have a huge um, list of publications, um, and so, you know, they do stand out when you look at her list of publications, they stand out. And it is, I, I know the person who wrote the obituary was a geometer. I and mean, it was, as I say, completely right that they uh, focused on, because that was her mathematical contribution and it was for a mathematical journal. But um, they did mention her uh, World War I, the aeronautical work, but, but only glancingly. So, um, so I, I, think, I think it was just at that time when, um, you know, they just didn't see that it was of particular interest. Um, and maybe if they knew Ross's name, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, you know, when I looked, I realized actually that is quite surprising that they didn't make any mention of it at all in the obituary. 
right? Mm -hmm. I have a question. I have, like, um, do you know she was married, had a family? No, no, she was not married. And you think no. that it was um, almost a necessity for her to be able to work like this? Uh, well, um, I mean, it's funny that, I mean, her sister didn't marry either. Um, I mean, I, she seems to have had lots of friends because she writes in her correspondence with Ross that she can't come and see him because she's doing this with her friends and she's doing she's looking after a friend who's ill and she's you know she seems to have a busy life and she's after she gives up working in um for the era you know after the war she she does a lot of social work um sort of vol voluntary work um but uh i you know i about her personal life i thought you know, these are actually the only real, that you know, there's correspondence with her. And I think it's very, not, you know, you see she's very, she writes very freely with him, even though they maintain this um, sort of formal, you know, dear Sir Ronald, you know, yours, Hilda Hudson, but the actual content of the letters, you could see some of the quotes I made, but, you know, there's quite, a, so it's very chatty. Um, but, uh, no, she was not, not, not mm -hmm. married. No. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, and he had a family. And other Yeah, with other with family, yeah. Um, I'm a sociologist. Sociologist, and who's worked a lot with doctors. And um, <laughs> there are two things. One, I, I was reminding this by HIV. When HIV first appeared, it made people really, really ill. But the medics, they, there was almost nothing they could do. They could treat people, try to relieve their symptoms. Um, so uh, the um, uh, uh, sort of first 10 years or so, in a way that epidemiologists, and my friend here, and sociologists, behavioral people, it was, it was really quite prominent. You know, what are we gonna do is behave these behaviors. Then when, when the drugs and the antiretrovirals, <laughs> we were sort of, it was this elbow to treat people. And suddenly it became by far the most dominant sort of um, came to dominate the whole business of HIV AIDS. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So I think it's um, doc the other thing about doctors, it seems to me, is they, they're not all, I did about mathematicians, but they, they're trained in, they're all trained in the same way, essentially. So that's first sort of five years and then. They're very, they're very siloed as they emerge into make choices about am I going to study malaria or obstetric. Siloed already. Um, whereas I, I don't know about mathematicians, but certainly sociologists, we're not very siloed, you know, people nip about things. Uh, I think, I think, I mean, to me, Certainly, mathematics has 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 broadened out dramatically. I think you know in the, in the last thirty years. I mean, I wonder how many departments had people doing you know mathematics and biology, you know, thirty forty years ago, um, for example. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think that we see that that a lot of it. I think maths had did go through a period of being very sort of siloed in a way too. People are in the, you know, certain specialisms and there's probably two other people in the world who could you could really talk to about if you're at the very top of your of your area. And I think there's much, you know, we see much more of a kind of integration now and, and departments with more uh, you know different different departments coming together. Um, so um, but of course I mean there's always been you know the application of, of mathematics to you know <laughs> I mean that's how it, it I mean, largely, so much of the profession was because people were employing mathematicians to, you know, whether it was Frederick the Great's employing Euler to build his fountains or whatever. I mean, you know, it's, um, uh, but I think things things kind of narrowed down and have now really started to broaden out. I think you could probably. Did, did the <laughs> pandemic, because I mean, you did this work during a pandemic that was, I mean, um, a connection there or was it a coincidence? Well, or? interested in Hudson actually it was through my, uh, my colleague Jeremy who's here because we uh, did some work on geometry at Cambridge many years ago um, and that's where her name came up and because I'm just been interested particularly um, recently and interested in women in, in mathematics and I had a PhD student uh, Tony Royal who was looking at what women mathematicians did during the first world war 
And so her name very much came up then. So I started looking at her again, and then I sort of, you know, looked at these papers, and I suddenly thought, oh, I haven't ever really kind of noticed. You know, they haven't, they have never been highlighted before. So. Um, uh, but nowadays, I mean, SIR models, I didn't know before, but all of a sudden, I mean, quite a few people know about them. Yeah, we, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, you know, that this is really one of the very first examples, and, it, yeah. and it's down to her. I mean, she's the one who brings immunity into the picture. So these, these compartments of yeah. I mean, infected yeah. and, and uh, immune and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see them. Sorry, um, June, you probably said, um, but how long was it before that it was generally accepted that the, that, the, that the patterns and statistical processes, which they seem to have, have um, started to, to, well, to prove and establish, were actually generally accepted throughout um, well, the think, medical profession? Yeah, well, I think this paper by Kermit and McKendrick really started firing things off. That was the one, yeah. yeah. Um, that you know, people did respond to that, and, and um, certainly McKendrick had been writing other things as well. Um, and and this this I think, uh, and I think it was a more propitious time. Um, and uh, the fact that Ross actually also uh, managed to convince the the Royal Society to to help pay for the republication of those papers, I think you know it started you know there started to be a kind of groundswell of people realizing that there was something. Something here, and, and the map, you know, and they were getting more deeper. They were getting yeah, more deeply into the mathematics of it, and actually um, coming up with models that people could start start to use. So I think that it, it, that is probably more the watershed moment. Um, the, and then Kermit and McKendrick, that that's the first paper. They then go on and publish. It's the one I can't remember how many. Whether it's three papers they publish, but um, uh, but that's the one that really uh, sets things going. But I think again, I think you know Ross. Ross is um, is very much part of that story because he's you know the one who really encourages um, Kendrick to to use mathematics in this way because he's 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 a doctor as well as well. Kendrick. Um. Um, uh, <laughs> front, front row first. I'm intrigued by the fact that. Um, Hilda Hudson stopped working effectively um, because it must have been so hard for her as a woman to have studied at university, to have secured employment. And then it seems that she chose to stop working or were well, there barriers thrown in her way? I mean, I mean my, my reading of it, and I don't have you know, kind of concrete evidence of it, but I think that she must have become financially independent. Mm -hmm. um, the job that she had at West Ham Technical Institute would have been basically a teaching job to maybe engineers um, and whatever. There was no way she was going to get um, an academic job as we would know it today. The fact that Charlotte Scott, she got her professorship at Bryn Mawr, she could not have got the job here. Philippa Fawcett, who was above the senior angle in 1890, she kind of left maths more or less altogether. Um, the only woman really who carries on producing mathematics, I would, I mean, there, of course, there are a number, but I mean, one best known is Grace um, Chisholm, Grace Chisholm Young, but she didn't have a position. Um, it was her husband, um, William Young, who had a position. I mean, just, well, I mean, apart from she could have gone back to Newnham uh, as a lecturer. But what, what was the value in that for her mm. when actually, if she was financially independent, she could do her research and she had the connections. That was the other thing, of course. I, um, uh, I guess, you know, that would have been adv advantageous for her being on the Council of the London Mathematical Society, for instance. Um, you know, she had her reputation with the ICM for, um, with her publications. Um, and then, uh, with her, I mean, so I think um, there was, there would have been no advantage for her working um, in, in mathematics because she basically she would have been a school teacher more or less, mm. um, not much better. I and mean, that was the that was the reality. So she became freelance. Yeah, yeah, she became an independent scholar. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, June, for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering whether the we've had a mention of HIV/AIDS. Um, whether there was any connection at all at the time of 18, 1918, 1919 to the great flu epidemic, which I think... Yeah, actually, interestingly, they don't, 
they don't mention that at all. And I think because, of course, that comes in the hiatus. You know, when when Hudson stopped working, Ross has got cheesed off. Um, and then it's 19, you know, it's nine, 1928 when they pick it up again. So, you know, I think had Hudson gone back to work with Ross in 1919, 1920, I think, what, I think the, the history could have been very different. Um, but there's no, there's no mention of it at all. And there's no, when they're looking at for statistics and things, I mean, it's this typhoid epidemic in, um, in Maidstone and it's the measles epidemics in um, Liverpool, uh, but also actually, I think it's Brownlee has done some, um, uh, some work on that from the other perspective. So that there's a kind of interest in that there, but you're, I mean, it is curious, you might expect them, to, to at least mention it in the in the correspondence. But as I say, there is this kind of hiatus between sort of like, I think 1919, 1920 until, um, uh, and the way the correspondence goes, I have a feeling that they must have been in touch somehow in between, but there, there there's nothing in the archives um, or nothing, you know, nothing in any of the archives I've seen. Speaking of the archives, I found it curious that you could find the reviews of an article. Is it common to keep reviews and even know the reviewers and so on? Yeah. At the time, were they anonymous? Do you well, know? What, I mean the, the, like the Burnside rejected this paper. Oh, yeah, so the, it's wonderful. The Royal Society have um, they've kept all their referees' reports, so you can go and look at them. Um, and uh, yeah, they make fascinating readings. <laughs> Sometimes they're that. quite candid, some of them. Um, so, but uh, but that's unusual, unfortunately. I mean, things like the London Mathematical Society, because that was a peripatetic organisation until it settled down in, mm -hmm. in Russell Square. So I think you know they, the secretaries and whatever would pull in the, the referees' reports, and they yeah. maybe hang on to them for a while. But they didn't have they didn't uh -huh. have anywhere to keep them. But the Royal Society did, and they and they and they kept them. Um, and the, 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 do you know whether they were anonymous these reviews or whether no, they? they know, you know, you no, no, no. I mean, so you as an author would know who referee you were. Um, um, they would sometimes they would be in co in correspondence with them. So I think they, yeah, I think they were anonymous with the um, um, uh, with the authors. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, but then sometimes they would. Yeah, um, if it's a positive report. You yeah, can, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but sometimes, you no, know, I think they, they definitely would have been anonymous with some okay. of the things I've read. Yeah, um, yeah because I found that, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, they, I mean, they did, they, uh, Ross and, and Hudson didn't know it was ever who, mm. um, who was there. And, it, and the fact that it was just, there's only one referee's report. Mm. I mean, normally they, you would expect there to be more than one. Mm. But again, that may be because of the war. Okay. Um, but then they, they got three people for Ross's other paper. Um, but uh, so I. But this was not a, um, um, an epidemic paper. No, no, that was his iteration paper. That the one that, that Burnside okay. yeah, said, yeah. you know, basically this is this is um, you know tribute. Tri yeah, more or less. <laughs> um, and and was McMahon was kind of quite chummy with Ross. They'd been in communication okay. before anyway. So so he probably didn't even read it and just said yes, it's fine. Okay. Um, uh, so. Mm. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, let's get the microphone and then you can. A tentative question asked as a biologist and not as a mathematician. But one thing, uh, um, the, the COVID pandemic has sort of encouraged people to keep an eye on the R value. Is this basically what uh, Ross and Hudson were working towards? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, they were, that, you know, that, that's what you're, you know, you're trying to work out how many people are going to be infected, you know, at a particular, you know, you, you look and you say, okay, at a certain time, you know, um, given what we know, what, what's the situation going to be, and, uh, you know, as, as time progresses. So, yes, um, although that's not what they, how they, um, how they framed it. Um, but what they wanted to what they wanted to do was have a mathematical model which would show you know given these constants that you you had a handle on then you could predict how the epidemic was going to um, progress and you know how long you know when when would you expect it to peak when was it going to die down and so their model did show them you know things like the seasonal variations and 
um, thing. Um, so exactly, I mean, that's, um, you know, you want to know when is it going to start uh, tailing off. And because they didn't have computers to simulate something, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, they, the mathematics was challenging enough that you needed, I mean, yeah, somebody yeah, I was mean, good so, at so it. I think throwing the numbers at it was going to be a pretty, you know, challenging uh, mm -hmm. thing, which is why they, you know, didn't do it straight away. And why, you know, when Hudson said, look, we're going to need, we're going to need statistics with, like she said, with thousands of, of uh, data points. So, I mean, you know, that's going, that's going to be... But, but these curves were explicit yeah, calculations. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 these were... yeah. So, the, so their math produced, gave them the curves and they okay. wanted to see that then if you actually had some statistics okay. and, and would, they, would the two things marry, right. marry together. I have here comments, but it's um, any more questions? Well, let me conclude then with a comment from the online audience by Jeffrey Thomas and says, thanks you very much. And uh, I think we can all confirm what this, uh, what uh, he says, a very illuminating and thorough presentation. I think we learned a lot. So thank you very much.